good to be in the sanctuary of the Lord. God gives us perspective when we tune in to what God has to say from his word. And uh, before we get into the word today, I want to just ask you, have I ever told you the story of Jenny's grandpa's last day of driving? You ever heard that, tell you that story before? Well, I'm going to tell you it anyways if I did tell it, but... Uh, Several years back, it was a comical story that Grandpa Claude told my wife and I. He, had since, pa- he has since passed on to glory. He, he, he passed away at the age of 103. All right, yeah. But it was his, his 98th year on this earth that he decided that he probably should not be driving anymore. You see, Grandpa lived up in, the, in, in a small town, Governor, up in northern New York. And just in case you were wondering, it's also the birthplace of E.J. Noble, who successfully launched Peppermint Lifesavers around the nation. I believe somewhere actually in Jenny's family line, there is the inventor of the Cherry Lifesaver as well. So, I guess well, I married up, all right? <laughs> but um, back to Grandpa Claude. He told us a story about one day how he was driving, and all of a sudden he realized that there were flashing lights behind him. It was the popo, all right? <laughs> Grandpa Claw pulled over, the police officer who then approached his vehicle afterwards, and, and uh, as Grandpa Claw rolled down the window, the police officer kindly said, Do you know why I'm pulling you over, sir? Grandpa had no idea. And the officer said, well, sir, you were, you were driving in and out of the oncoming lane. Police officer probably thought that he was pulling over like a dr- drunk driver or something, but then he soon realized that this guy's 98, all right? But uh, Grandpa's response to the officer was, yeah, the lines these days, they're getting a lot blurrier for me. I sometimes can't tell the white ones from the yellow ones. On both sides of the, the, the lanes, right? Now, I don't know what was going through the officer's mind at that point, but he gave, gave Grandpa Claude a warning, and he followed him home to make sure that he was okay. Now, when Grandpa was telling us this story, he was pretty proud that day that he did not get a ticket, all right? He told us, he said, he said, the cop knew who I was. He knew my name. He must have heard of me before. See, we did not have the heart to tell them, hey, Grandpa, when, you, when your plates get scanned, uh, they get all your information from that. <laughs> but he proceeded to tell us how his house was the fifth built in Governor, New York, and all of the history of why he probably was known by said police officer, okay? But it was soon after this, he decided on his own accord that it's probably not a good thing to uh, keep driving while these lines are so blurry. So he, he kind of gave up driving at that point. And this morning, we're going to look at an Old Testament story that is actually here for you and for me. Uh, no, I'm serious. The story was handpicked by God to be put in his word to be an example for us to live from, to learn from. The Apostle Paul actually tells us that the Old Testament was written for our admonition. There are examples that we can learn from in life. And today we're going to lean into this idea that it's not a good thing to blur the lines. So would you read with me in 1 Samuel chapter 13? It says, Saul lived, I'm sorry, no, verse (laughs) 5. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore in in multitude. They came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of beth Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble for the people who were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal and all the people followed him trembling. Doesn't sound like the greatest day for a king. Know what I'm saying? Anybody ever have a bad day before? Yeah. Everybody, anybody ever feel like, oh, this is not good. There is no way we're winning this fight. Right? I, I kind of feel that way going into this week because, you see, um, I play roller hockey and it's the playoffs. And everybody makes the playoffs. We're not undefeated. We're defeated. We're 0 10 and 2 But guess what? We have resolved that we're going to win out in the playoffs, all right? So I need to pray for us because we want to win this championship, right? 
but, but we're feeling a little bit like Saul and the Israelites, all right? But in verse 8, it goes on, it says, He waited, Saul waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I, I forced myself. That's comical to me. I forced myself. I had to do this. You know, I just, you know, I, I, I made myself do this. Even though I know, no, it wasn't, you know, what we talked about, I, I knew I had to do this. Okay, Saul. Very good. Not really. Bad, bad choice. And, 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 and so I forced myself, offered the burnt offering. Verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. Imagine if that's how we talked to one another today. You're stupid. <laughs> that's what Samuel was saying. That was a dumb choice. You've not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you've not kept what the Lord had commanded you. And Samuel rose, went up from Gilgal, and the rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. Hmm. Whoa. It's like, Samuel, really? Why are you so serious here, man? Was it that big of a deal that Saul was trying to ask for God's favor? I mean, isn't that a good thing? Who, who wants the favor of God in their life? I sure, certainly do. But you know what's interesting? We can go after the favor of God in all the wrong ways. That's what this story is all about, actually. See, even though Saul was looking for God's favor, his actions revealed that he did not really trust God. Instead, he took it upon himself to bring a resolution to a problem that was way too big for him. Saul was not the answer to this problem. The king was not going to be able to, to do in his own humanity what, what only God could do. And here's what I want you to know today. Blurred lines lead to rude awakenings. I want you to say that with me. Blurred lines lead to rude awakenings. We all have the tendency to do this. We push the boundary just a little bit, starting with Adam and Eve, actually. Oh, did God really say that you will surely die if you eat the fruit of that tree? Oh, if I do eat this fruit, I'll actually be better off, though. I'll advance myself. I'll be smarter. I'll be wiser. It's some good-looking fruit, and this is going to make me wise. Then I'm sure it'll be all right, right? Wrong. It didn't make you wise. It made you dumb, actually. And now you're going to have to contend with something that you never had to worry about before, death. Death wasn't a part of this world, but you brought it in because of the choice that you made. And sometimes because of the choices that we make that are actually contrary to what God says, we bring a sense of spiritual death into our own lives. Achan did this too. God told the Israelites when they're going to the promised land not to take a thing from Jericho when they conquered the city. Not fully sure why, but God has his reasons. And Israel went in, they blew the trumpets, walked around the walls, the, the city walls came tumbling down. And guess what Achan saw? A big old bar of gold, a bag of silver, a Babylonian garment that I'm sure is going to look pretty good in my my wardrobe, I'm sure that God won't mind. I'm sure it's not going to affect anything. I'm sure everything will be fine. Wrong. Rude awakening. Don't forget about Lot's wife too. God in his mercy gave Lot, his daughters, his wife, a ticket out from oncoming judgment. But they had to get going. They didn't have time to wait around. You don't have time to waste. Get up, get going, get gone. Oh, and one thing, though, don't look, don't look back. Guess what? Lot's wife 
she looked back. And the word used in the Bible isn't just a, a little quick glance. It wasn't like she just kind of looked back or just was like this. No, no, no. It translates as she regarded. She paid close attention to. She was considering. She was looking back. She was enthralled in what was going on. We can't say with certainty whether she was identifying too much with the city and her way of life and she was grieved because she could no longer live that way or she was just reluctant to obey God's leading in her life. Either way, she blurred the line and she looked back and bam, rude awakening. Before she might have been a little bit sassy, but now she's salty, let me tell you. <laughs> right? Because she's blurring the lines. What is the line? The line is the place of my will and God's commandment. Will I walk in God's commandment in obedience or will I test? Will I dabble over into my will? Have you ever played the game Capture the Flag before? Favorite of mine, if you ever want to play, maybe we'll organize a nice big church game, all right? But listen... My family and I, every winter, we, we play a game of capture the flag. We go out in the yard and we draw this line, like we kind of take our, our boots and we just scrape a line out of the snow all the way down to the grass so it establishes the, the line that you can't cross if you're on, on the team unless you, you potentially could get tagged that way and all that kind of stuff, right? And, and, you know, if you go on the other team's side, they can tag you and bring you to jail, right? The object is for you to get over there, grab their flag, get it back to your side and all that kind of stuff, Okay. But after a game or two of playing capture the flag with the family, that line gets a bit more challenging to see in the snow because, you know, you're, you're kind of near that line and so your footprints start to dig deep and, and, and now there's, it's a little bit more muddy and grassy in that line. The line kind of gets bigger and, and, and then inevitably something happens. When those lines get blurry, there's an argument that will break out that this person tagged that person because they were on this side, but then they said, no, the line wasn't there, and then end of capture the flag game, right? When the bl lines are blurry, you don't really know where you stand. You don't know what side you're standing on. And when this happens in our lives, sometimes we try to convince ourselves that we're standing on God's side of the line when we're really standing on the other side. God never, ever, never, ever, ever, never does he ever blur the line. For Saul, though it was seven days, even though the opposition looked daunting, even though this team was giving up and the Israelites were running away, it did not give him permission to blur a line that shouldn't have been blurred. You see, if you rewind just a little bit back with me to 1 Ch Samuel chapter 10, verse 8, you'll find that Samuel the priest, the judge, the prophet of God, gave Saul specific instructions that day. And I mean, he gave him the right directions. He told him, wait seven days. I'll come, I'll perform the sacrifice, and then we'll talk about what needs to happen next. For the new king Saul, this was a test. Would he humble himself and learn or would he lean on his own understanding? Saul ultimately failed this test. We know that going into the story. But it's a lesson for you and for me when we walk the road of faith with God. Will I lean into the Lord or will I lean on my own understanding in life? When we blur the lines that God has made, maybe not immediately, but somewhere down the road, you'll be in a worse position than you thought of originally. You can't kick the can of obedience down the road and expect that there's never going to be any consequence for the decisions that you make in life. Take, for instance, just simply in finances, if you continue to spend, spend, spend now and delay savings, guess what? You're never going to get out of debt and you'll never be able to walk in financial stewardship and freedom that God offers you. So I could talk about a host of different things that we can easily blur the line on when it comes to God's word and what he tells us to do so that we live life in a way that is honoring to God and blessed by God. 
Today, here's the thing that I want us to make sure that we don't run to. I, I'm not talking to the society and the culture out there. I'm talking to the church that's in here. I'm not talking to the world and all that's going on out there. I'm talking to the people of God. I'm talking to us, the church, the bride, the body of Christ. It's easy to point at culture and get angry about how the lines are all blurred and everything is gray. But let's not deflect. Let's talk about us. Let's talk about how God wants us to get realigned. Listen, we're in the summertime and people are here, there, and everywhere. I hope everybody's enjoying the summer. We only get a few few months out of the year to do that sometimes outside and with the sunshine and all that kind of, it's all good. The church is, is you know, we're, we're doing our thing and all that kind of stuff. But God, God has a direction that he's taking us as a church. Do you believe that? Doesn't sound like it. Do you believe that God is, is moving us in a direction? The kingdom of God isn't just to sit idle. It's to move forward. God's got direction for us in our lives. We've got to be very careful that we're not blurring the lines and elevating certain things about what God has called us to do. How about the lines of Christian compassion? Where sometimes we as Christians are compelled to give or help and so we do. What a beautiful grace that is. However, sometimes we don't practice wisdom in our giving and helping and serving. And it turns out that now we are actually enabling people. Ever, ever been in that place where it's, man, I, th- I thought I was helping this person out and helping this person out. But then it felt like they were just using me. Anybody? You know, again, as Christians, we got to be careful that, 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 that compassion doesn't start to enable behavior. That can happen with, with parents and their kids. You know, we, we love our kids so much, but yet if, if we're not actually parenting them and, and actually teaching them and disciplining them in the ways of God and just kind of letting them do their thing and just, well, I love them so much, guess what? You're not helping them out in life. Guess what's happening in the fall? Another political cycle that we're in. Everybody said yay. (laughs) You know, as Christians, we've got to be careful that we're not blurring the lines of our faith and our politics. Listen, as Christians, we should should certainly, absolutely 100%, be able to participate in terms of voting and all that stuff. Absolutely. Listen, if anybody knows me, I actually have plenty of political viewpoints. All right, I'm engaged in that way. However, I don't want to let my politics form my faith. I want to let God's word in, my, in faith form my politics. Can I get an amen? That should be all of life. Not just politics. It should be every aspect of life. We should be leaning into God. Listen, as a church, we have a lot of great ministries that go on. As a church, another way that we can blur the lines. We've got an amazing homeschool co-op. We've got awesome kids ministries and youth ministries. and all. Those are all beautiful things, but they're a part of the church. They are not the church. Does that make sense? Sometimes we can elevate different things. To be what they're not. God called us as a church to gather and to go. To be on mission for what he's called us to. We can blur the lines in relationships. We can blur lines in morals, in ethics. We can blur the line in so much these days. We've got to be careful. We've got to be really careful. For King Saul... He had very little experience in, learn, in leading the military against other proven nations. He had just been anointed king not long ago. He certainly had no experience in leading the nation spiritually by performing a sacrifice before God. It wasn't his job. It wasn't his position. And it wasn't his responsibility either. But he blurred the lines of instruction for fear that people would not have approved of his leadership. He was afraid of the people around him. They wouldn't respect him as a leader if he didn't take care of a situation that he actually wasn't even equipped for. 
He's saying King Saul was given instructions by Samuel. We've already read it out of 1 Samuel chapter 10. For Saul's benefit, for Saul's future, for Saul's maturity. Hey, do this, do this. This is what's going to get us to where we need to go. But Saul ended up blurring the lines, which started him on a projection where those lines just kept getting more and more and more blurry until he eventually, at the end of his life, he turned to sorcery because he lost all confidence in hearing the voice of God. He, he turned the farthest away, to, uh, away from God to try to hear God. It didn't make any sense. Because that's what blurred lines do. They confuse you. Let's take a look at why these lines can get blurry today. You might not always understand God's thoughts and his ways, but he'll never, ever be a God of confusion in your life. So how does God's commandments get blurred in our lives? Well, first, there can be a lack of spiritual knowledge. Listen, if you, if you didn't learn it, you don't know it. You know, how, how can you be accountable for that? If you've never been taught something of, of the Lord, then of course you might blur some lines. And that's understandable. We're not talking about immaturity. We're talking about intentional blur. Intentional blurring the lines. See, it wasn't the case for Saul. Israel, uh, throughout the Old Testament, they often lacked spiritual knowledge because they ignored God's ways. Not because they didn't know God's ways. There was another prophet that lived hundreds of years after Samuel who was speaking for God. He was communicating uh, on, on behalf of God about the people of Israel. And it says this in Hosea chapter 4, 6. He says, my people are destroyed, rude awakening, for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. The Israelite nation was supposed to be a nation of a priesthood. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, Hosea says, I will forget your children. Again, rude awakening. And this wasn't God being mean. It wasn't God being heavy-handed. It wasn't God trying to take out Israel and just being petty about this. No, Israel was supposed, they had a mandate from God. And time and time again, they chose to reject the ways of God. They ignored God's laws and did things like all the other nations did and worse. God wasn't rejecting the people of Israel because, again, he was just kind of being petty. No, he was rejecting them because they, were, they had already rejected God. And there's so much, there's only so much that you can do for a people who flat out choose not to listen to you. Maybe you've experienced that before. You've helped somebody out. You brought them into something. You give them a chance. Whatever. You bless them. Whatever it might be. But, but after a little while, they, they kind of just, they, 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 they kind of dip on you. Or they, 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 they really don't appreciate you. Anybody ever feel underappreciated? I think we all have, right? Right? We all can get into that place. I wonder how God feels at times. Do you ever think that God might feel underappreciated? I think so. I think so. I, we all know that feeling. I just imagine God, right? And, and that's what Israel did to God time and time again. They'd go to God for his hands of blessing, yet they would reject all of God's ways in his heart. And church, we got to be careful. We can fall into that danger, those rude awakenings like anybody else. Paul writes to a young pastor, Timothy, about uh, what will be prevalent in, in the times that we live in. He says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate, they will stockpile, they will get a ton, they will gather to themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. They'll blur the lines of God and make God all about themselves rather than about who God really is. Listen, if you're here for the first time and you're simply curious about God, uh, listen, I, I love you. I'm, I'm so blessed that you're here. And I'm just letting you know today, I'm, I'm actually not really talking to you. If you don't know Jesus, or you're just, you know, you're kind of like curious about this God thing, you get a pass today, all right? All right, but, but for those that are followers of Jesus, the bride of Christ, we've got no excuse to blur the lines. 
We're not allowed to interpret the scriptures based on our own opinions, our own pleasures, our own ways of life. That's called manipulation. You and I were not afforded the ability to change what God says because we don't like it. In essence, that's what King Saul was doing. He didn't like the situation that he found himself in, so he took it upon himself to do something that he wasn't authorized to do. He changed what God said because he didn't like what was going on around him. How do we do that? Well, we start grumbling about our boss when we don't like our work experience. Yet God clearly tells us, don't grumble. It's a command. We blur that line. We get offended with somebody in our own circle and refuse to kind of, kind of, we just kind of push them away, right? We don't do it God's way. Or we don't actually take the time to consider about somebody else's circumstance, right? All of these things. I could, I could name a bazillion commands in the Bible that we can have a tendency to blur the lines in our humanity. We ignore God's word. But still expect that God's going to make life happy and fun for us. See, another piece of Saul blurring the line was based on his immediate circumstance being louder than God. He was getting attacked by uh, an army and his, his own people were running away. I get it, it's not good. But for Saul, this was still a test. Would he trust God or would he trust his own judgment call? Saul trusted his own judgment. You blur the line when there is an allowance of the circumstance to dictate your own truth. What do I mean by that? The uncomfortable circumstance that Saul was in dictated a truth to him at least in his own mind, that he had to do this sacrifice thing, that he had to be the guy to call on the favor of God. Now it's funny to me because immediately after he did the sacrifice, on day seven, when Samuel said that he was going to be there, the amount of days that Samuel said to wait, Saul, Saul still did it anyways. Immediately afterwards, Samuel shows up. Why did Saul do it? It was because he was anxious. Ever been anxious before? Sometimes we do things when we're anxious that we wish we didn't do. Right? Anybody? We get all worked up. We get in a tizzy. Right? We get maybe angry or frustrated or whatever it might be. Anxiety has the great potential to cause us to make decisions that aren't healthy, that aren't godly, and aren't good. Anxiety has a tendency to blur the lines in our lives. Now we've all felt anxious time to time. We're all going to feel those ways. I would have probably felt very anxious if I was Saul too. But anxiety does not give us a pass to blur the line. Right? We do that. We get anxious about things. Maybe your child is not quite responding to the things of God like you were hoping for. And we get anxious about that. Or things at work seem, don't seem to be getting any less crazy. In fact, there's more being asked of you with, little, little le with less resource for you. Right? Or, or maybe you've been waiting and waiting and waiting for a door to open up and, and nothing seems to be changing. Everyday circumstance can dictate your perception of truth. Jesus t t taught us that each day has trouble of its own. So don't be anxious for what tomorrow has. We've got enough, enough to take care of today. When we start to live in a place where the circumstances reveal our truth or our perceived truth, we, we're blurring the lines. If we're not careful, we'll fall prey to modern day relativism. Whether it's moral or ethical or cultural relativism, all of it points to this idea that belief is relative to your social context. Relativism means that there's no specific truth. That it's relative. And truth to the relativist is subjective. It's based on your own feeling and your own context. So here's the, here's the thing. It means that because the ancient Aztecs practiced human sacrifice by offering people's hearts to their gods, that's deemed relative to their society and thereby okay. That's not okay, right? That's not okay. But you always find contradictions in relativism and when we're blurring the lines and blurring the truth. As people, we rebel against God. And in order to appease how we live, we try to just look the other way. With Jesus, there's really is right and wrong. 
There is light and darkness. There is good and there is evil. There is truth. There is error. There is moral and there is immoral. There is eternal life and there is eternal death. There's a line. There's no blurred lines with Jesus. But sometimes we blur the lines because there's simply a disregard for the commandments of God. Sometimes we just don't want to do what God tells us to do, right? Is there anybody else like that? Okay, because I'm in that boat and um, I don't always like to do what God's telling me to do, right? In fact, sometimes I fight it. Saul was told in seven days, Samuel's going to show up. He's going to take care of it, right? But he did not do that. He disregarded the instruction that he received. Because sometimes we just don't want to do it or we don't see how that's going to work. But Samuel was God's authority in Saul's life. And God works with order and in order and through order. When you honor that authority in your life, God will honor you. God designed you and me. We're free moral agents, meaning we can choose whether or not we'll follow God's directions or we'll make up our own. But there's consequences when we choose to live outside of God's instructions in our lives. The Bible says everybody's going to reap what they're going to sow. The Bible also says it's afforded once for a person to die and then you'll stand before the judgment seat of God. That means there's accountability in life. The world is lacking accountability. We know that, but where are we as the church? Are we living accountable lives? Saul made a poor decision for all these reasons stated, but also for one more. We blur the lines when there is a desire to appear as something that you're not. George MacDonald said half of the misery in this world comes from trying to look instead of trying to be what one is not. Saul was not a proven leader yet. He was barely a king. Just because he had a position did not mean that he had the experience. Saul was not a priest or a prophet, yet he chose to step over Samuel's position and do something that he did not have authorization to do, and that was perform the sacrifice. Saul chose to look, the look of a competent leader over the obedience of a trusting servant. He chose the image over the obedience. He wanted to look the part in people's eyes. And unfortunately for Saul, he was more afraid of what people were thinking rather than what God was thinking. He failed under that pressure. This can get us in a lot of ways. We can appear that we have everything going on. We can appear that we're walking with Jesus. We can appear that we're doing everything great. But the truth of our real condition will catch up to us. There's another story in the Bible that happened hundreds of years later. It was right after the church was born. One guy sells his field and gives the entire proceeds to the church for missions. Everybody cheers them on and it's amazed at the grace of God in his life. And right afterwards, there's a married couple, Ananias and Sapphira, think to themselves, wow, everybody's cheering him, him on. He's getting quite the influence in the church. I bet if, if we did that, everybody else would, would really pat us on the back too. We'd get the influence as well. So they sell some of their property too. But they decided that they didn't want to give all the proceeds to the church, just some of them, which was totally fine. They were under no compulsion to give as it was. But they told everybody that they were giving all the proceeds just like the other guy did. And they were lying. And they thought that they could lie to God. They blurred the lines, and guess what? They faced a rude awakening. Immediate judgment. Drop dead because they lied, because they wanted to appear as something that they were not. They wanted recognition in the church, approval in the church. They wanted honor and influence in the church. They blurred the line and were faced with a rude awakening. Now, for them, it was more like a rude sleepening, all right? So they passed away. It's a crazy story. They weren't robbing money from God. They were robbing glory from God. And that's not okay. Saul was too. He started to live a life with a trajectory that was ripping off God from glory. He wanted to be the hero. He wanted to be it. Really that's what pride does. It elevates us to 
try to get what only God should be receiving. And that's praise. That's worship. And for us, we can either choose Saul's way or we can choose Christ's way. And sometimes in life, it feels like one of these spinners. Right? Different situations might feel like, okay, good. Not good. I just chose Saul's way. Right? I did my thing. I did it my way. And sometimes, hopefully I get something different than... <laughs> and sometimes we get, we get Christ, you know. Sometimes we, we make the decision. And it's good and, and, and we're obeying the command, right. Sometimes it's, it's a mixture, you know. We, we, kind of, we kind of do part of what Christ calls us to do, but kind of part of it in our own way. And we live this life just continuing to spin this thing, but God's like, no. There's no spinners in life. It's a line. It's a path. And I'm calling to walk down the path. I've said this before. Two different things. We can believe in God all we want. But believing God, believing in God is different than believing God. You can believe in God. Say, yep, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God. But believing God means that you're believing him at his word and you're following him and you're saying, God, I trust that your commandment is true, it's right, it's good, and it's better than my judgment. You see, Jesus, he exemplified that for us. See, that's the thing about these Old Testament kings. They're here for a reason to point us to the New Testament king, to Jesus Christ. Now, obviously Saul and Jesus, quite the contrast. Saul helps us to see how great and how wonderful and how beautiful Jesus is. Jesus showed us how to establish godly definition in our lives. If you ever worked out before or lifted weights, you know what it means to establish muscle definition. You start eating a high like protein diet and you're doing a lot of strength training because you want to define your muscles. Similarly, Jesus teaches us spiritually how to establish godly definition for godly muscles in our lives so that when we're attempted to blur that line, we choose Christ and not Saul. Again, Saul's error can teach us what not to do. His failings can actually point us more clearly to the ways of Jesus. We can learn from his mistakes. Well, how do we define the line? Well, first, accept that patience is God's process for you. If King Saul would have just waited a couple more hours... He would have not been in the mess that he created for himself. He would not have been told that his kingdom was going to be ripped away from him. Psalm 37, 7 says, wait for the Lord and be patient. Don't fret. Don't worry about the evil schemes of the wicked. Patience is certainly an exercise of faith. Sometimes the greatest exercise of faith. If something's going on, I want to take care of it. Anybody else like that? If I can do so, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take care of business. I'm going to take care of what needs to happen, right? I've got to take care of things. Well, sometimes that's okay, but sometimes it's not. See, patience is the living demonstration of dependence on God and not self. Patience invites God to work on behalf of you, not in spite of you. Patience is not a passive tolerance of things that we don't like or disagree with. The biblical definition of patience is an unyielding, defiant perseverance in the face of aggressive adversity. Patience is courage that knows how to wait. And patience is God's process for our lives. God brings us into the waiting room sometimes in life to chip away our own self-dependence. 
Listen, even Jesus sat in the waiting room for 18 years. It says at the end of Luke chapter 2, at the age of 12, Jesus went back to Nazareth and submitted to his parents. He grew in wisdom and stature before God and man. Jesus finally breaks on the scene when he's 30 years old. That's 18 years. It took him 18 years to finally walk into the mission that his heavenly father called him to. Moses waited for 40 years. Joshua waited for 40 years. Abraham waited till he was 100 years old to have a, a son. God can do very little with the impatient because they're always running ahead thinking they know what they need to do. Patience in the midst of the challenge is a lived out reliance upon the nature and the power of God. Saul was impatient and ultimately learned nothing. The next chapter we find that he almost kills his own son Jonathan because his own son was, wasn't aware of a command that Saul gave his army and he broke it. Saul had to be talked down by his guys in order not to take out the life of his own son. And yet just the chapter before, Saul disobeys a commandment. And the chapter afterwards, Saul disobeys another commandment. God gives him a strategy and he does it his way. How hypocritical is that? Another way that we can establish God, godly definition in our lives is to seek spiritual discernment over spiritualized information. Church, let me unpack this for a moment. I fear the church is so overinflated with spiritualized information that we lack spiritual discernment in the days that we live in. We've got Christian radio, we've got sermons, we've got songs, we've got podcasts, we've got message after message, YouTube, uh, reel after reel, all of these different things. We post all this Christian information, all this spiritualized information. And I'm not necessarily saying that's bad, but sometimes all of that information takes the place of actual spiritual discernment. Because we're not making wise decisions with all that we're receiving from God. And we're not actually walking out obediently the commandments of God. We're just constantly inundating ourselves with spiritualized information. That actually what that does, it deceives us in our Christianity. Thinking that we're walking with God, thinking that we're in, in the right with God, thinking that we're on the right side of that line, but really we're just appeasing a certain flesh side of us to say, I'm doing the spiritual thing by getting all this information. Not if you're not living it out. Paul prayed for the Philippian church that their love would abound more and more in the knowledge and insight so that they'd be able to discern what is best and pure and blameless in the generation. The goal of spiritual knowledge is not in learning something, but living something. The writer of Hebrews talks about how maturity has grown through the discernment of God's word. We've got so much spiritualized information out there that sounds nice and all that, and you can heart it on Instagram all you want, but does it take shape in your life? Saul knew that they shouldn't, should not be moving forward without asking God's favor. That's good. But he did not discern what was the right step to take. There's a YouTube channel called The Pursuit of Wonder that gives a great insight to the day that we live in of existentialism. It's basically the idea that ultimately life is meaningless. Listen, we as in our humanity, we go through that. Solomon went through it. He, he taught on it. We've got that in the Bible. But ultimately, existentialism is, is, is hopeless. It doesn't lead anywhere that's, that's good necessarily because there's no meaning. That's the, that's the point of it, right? But this is what it says. Now more than ever, we're exposed to a plethora of ideas about life. The internet has made it so that we consume a seemingly unending amount of content on the topic of living most effectively. However, simultaneously, this access to the information has also allowed the consumer to realize just how conflicting this information is. In the West, the popularity of traditional religion has reduced as a result. And for many, the increasing access to information has revealed that the world is basically without any discernible truth. 
And most ideas about how to live are inconclusive and unreliable. It is fair to speculate that this could be a major contributing factor to the modern world's increasing levels of anxiety, cynicism, and disillusion or delusion. Choosing between conflicting ideas of how to live has always been an, ind- an issue for the individual. But in the modern world of which we live, where conflicting ideas are constantly smacking us in the face, we can often find ourselves failing in our attempt to find footing in reality. At birth, it's as if we're all given a slab of clay. We get to choose what to mold that into. However, there is no right or wrong way to mold the clay. Rather, there are endless ways, all equally absurd, all equally meaningless. What a perspective that is. The thing that I'll agree with that perspective on is that the information that we get in this world and how saturated we are with information can certainly lead us to confusion. We know so much, yet we are confused so much. So many people feel and live meaningless lives. That's what existentialism is. It leads to there's nothing that really has meaning. And if we're not careful as the church, we can talk and listen and view and post tons of spiritualized content, but fail to live with any spiritual discernment. Saul chose spiritualized information over spiritual discernment. You can only get that by daily dependence on Christ. Connecting with Jesus routinely. Jesus exemplified this with his alone times with the Father. We should be doing that day in and day out. The next one that we want to take a look at to build godly definition is this. Put your trust in the commandment despite the appearance. We often most choose not to follow God's word because of how it's going to look. We're concerned with what other people will think of us. We're afraid either of our actions will look uh, like, like they're a bit freakish to this world or our inaction will make us look like we're not trusting God. Either way, the motivation's off. We're more concerned about appearance than righteousness. It looks way more like acting than authenticity. When we only follow God for appearance, God says that's hypocrisy. That's not holy. That's making yourself look godly when you're really full of self. Ever try to get summer ready before? You know, summer's coming. Got to get the bod ready, you know. Tone for summertime. Dean Gunther, he was a British tattoo artist. He received a request from a client that he was stoked about. He, he's so stoked about he did it for free. The client hated to work out, but he wanted to look like he did. So he wanted his abs to look like a six-pack. So he asked Gunther to tattoo a six-pack on his stomach. It would be a challenge for him, but it would be hilarious too if he was able to do it and pull this off. And so he agreed to. Afterwards, they shared a video on TikTok from a distance that looks impressive. But up close and personal, well, that's a different story. Here's the point. We shouldn't just be trying to have an appearance of goodness or righteousness or a six-pack. But we should live that out in our lives, right? Otherwise, it's just empty posturing. It's not about the appearance. It's about the commandment. It's not about looking the part. It's about living the part. Finally, we learn from Saul's mistake that you can be good with different because that's who God's called you to be. Look at somebody and say, be good with different. Israel wanted a human king like all the other nations around had. Saul was the first pick. So Saul was under a lot of pressure to have to perform. All eyes were on him. The problem was, that's not who God wanted Saul to be. God called him to be different than all the other kings of the world. To be holy because God is holy. To not live out the ways of this world, but to live out God's kingdom on this earth. God calls you to be holy because he is holy. He calls you to be the light of the world, shining for him in the generation and the hour of which we live. He calls you to be the salt of the earth. Your life might sting others a little bit, but you'll preserve them. 
God calls you not to conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and live out what God's perfect will is. That line, God calls you to be like stars that are shining in the midst of a crooked generation that blurs the lines, but your light might bring some clarity to them through your witness and your righteous living. Saul conformed to the world and not to Christ. He chose Saul every time and not God. Because of that, he encountered a rude awakening in his life. His kingdom would be given to a man and taken from him. It'd be given to a man that was after God's heart. Listen, a person going after God's heart is a person living before God's ways. Saying, I'm, I'm before you, God. I'm open. I'm living this life before you. Your life statement can say, I'm not going to walk on blurred lines. I'm going to define my life according to God's line. I'll care about God and his heart, his commandments, his ways, his righteousness more than what this world offers. That's what Christ is calling the church to in this generation. Right now. Today. It's not tomorrow. It's not the days ahead. We, we might not be able to do uh, anything in this world in terms of changing where things are at. I think we can because we've got the power of God in our lives. But who knows in terms of the day that we're living in. But you know what? That doesn't mean that I can't live the line out of God in my life. God's calling us to that. And in closing here today, we're going to take communion together. And so I want you to just get your hearts prepared. Just open up the little, little tablet up front, this, this bread here. Communion is all about the sacrifice of Christ. It's all about. See, there was a difference between Saul's sacrifice and Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice, it wasn't for appearances. In fact, his appearance was marred beyond belief. Jesus' sacrifice wasn't for God's favor. Actually, it was to take God's wrath upon himself so that we didn't have to take that wrath upon ourselves. Jesus' sacrifice wasn't to save his own skin. It was to save ours. This bread that we're about to take, it reminds us when everybody else ran away, everybody else was afraid, nobody else wanted to, to, to stand in that gap, Jesus stepped in and said, I'm going to take this one for the team. I'll die so that anybody who believes in me can live. He said, I'll forgive anybody who comes to me. Even though I didn't sin, I will be the one, I will be the forgiveness agent to the world. Jesus said, I'll give my body to be broken on a cross, even though it looks like I lost, this sacrifice is actually going to be the greatest win of all mankind. That's what he did for you and for me. And so, in honor of Jesus' sacrifice here today, could we take just this moment heart to heart with God, not heart to pastor to God, your heart to God's heart. Because the Holy Spirit is real and He is He's working in our lives. But we got to engage Him as well. We've got we've to we've lean on Him rather than our own understanding. Can we take a moment right now in this place, every person here just honoring God, and making it personal, I want you to thank God for his body that was broken for you. Can you take a moment just to do that in your own way before the Lord right now? And then I'll call us all to, to join together and partake.
Thank you, God. That although it was not fair, it was not fair that you had to break your body for me. You did it anyways. You loved me enough to say, I'll do this for you. I'll die for you so that you can live. Thank you, Jesus, for breaking your body for me. Let's partake. The cup, the grape juice we're about to partake of, it's a reminder of the blood of Christ. It's powerful. It's precious. It's perfect. His blood was given so that ours wouldn't need to be given. His blood paid the debt for my sin, made everything right for me, even though I did nothing to make it right. Listen, this blood gives us an opportunity. This blood is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. This blood says, I'm making a way for you to come to me. You can choose me. We can walk together. We can live again together in relationship. There's no separation between us anymore because of the blood that my son sent, the shed on the cross for you. This blood is kindness to my spiritual life that was dead before Jesus. It's made me alive in him. That's what the blood of Christ is. We've got to repent. We've got to say, God, I've done it my way. I've blurred the lines, and I am sorry for that. Thank you that your blood again can wash me whiter than snow. And so right now, I want to encourage you don't partake of this in an unworthy way. If there's sin in your hearts, if there's sin in your lives, Jesus says, hey, confess it to me. I'll cover it for you. I'm not giving you a pass. I want you to change. I want you to grow. I want you to mature in the ways of me. But let's start here. Let's start cleaning up your life here. At the cross, my blood poured out for you. That's the mercy of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy, for your kindness that has drawn me to you. Let's partake. In closing, there's a story about a man who was nicknamed Wrong Way Regals. On New Year's Day of 1929, Georgia Tech played UCLA in the Rose Bowl, and Roy Regals, a UCLA player, recovered a fumble in that game, and he picked up the ball, and he started running mad dash for the goal line. Problem was, he was running to the wrong end zone. His teammates were yelling at him, stop, stop, you're going the wrong way, and he just thought they were crazy. One of his teammates, Benny Lom, ran him down and he tackled him just before he scored a touchdown for the other team. A few plays later, Georgia Tech tackled UCLA in their end zone for a safety, all because of one play. That one guy, Roy Regals, was blurry on which way to go. That all happened in the first half. During halftime, everybody was demoralized for UCLA. Regals was horrified. He sat there, the towel over his face. Over his head, the coach didn't give his usual halftime speech. Three minutes later, with three minutes left, he spoke up and he said, listen, men, everybody, the team is gonna be, that played in the first half is gonna be the team that plays in the second half. We're, we're gonna, all the same players. Every player got up all but Regals. He didn't budge. As everybody exited, he remained. His cheeks were soaked with tears. He told the coach, I can't do it. I, I, I've ruined it. I've ruined the university's reputation. That was so dumb. I've ruined myself. I can't face going back out there. And the coach said, Regals, 
Roy, get up. Go back. The game is only half over. Regals did. And he played a great second half. Great second half. I want to remind us all here today that although we might have blurred some lines in our life, go play a great second half. Because the mercy of God, the mercy of God redirects and defines that line for us and helps us get right back on that line with Jesus. So go play a great second half and walk again with him. That's what Christ calls us to, and that's what his sacrifice has done for us. So can we take just a couple moments and just praise God for that right now in this place? Could we stand to our feet and just, let's just worship the Lord as we close things out today and lift his name up above whatever situation or circumstance that we find ourselves in.